Welcome to the return of the Primal Endurance Podcast. This is your host, Brad Kearns, and we are going on a journey to a kinder, gentler, smarter, more fun, more effective way to train for ambitious endurance goals. Visit primalendurance.fit to join the community and enroll in our free video course. Hello and welcome to part three of the three-part presentation on overtraining. Ah, we have to keep talking about this? Yes, because it's super important. It might be unpleasant, but we got to get this thing handled so it doesn't keep rearing its ugly head into your best laid plans. So to recap what we talked about in part one and part two, and then we're going to jump into part three with the emphasis on uh, how to not have it happen in the first place, and then how to recover and return to action wiser and more resilient for your future athletic ambitions. So in part one, we covered the stress response in the body, uh, how it works. What stress really is, is actually stimulus. We talk about stress in a negative context, but stress can be either positive or negative, and it comes in so many forms, not just pounding the pedals or uh, running uphill on the trail. Uh, We have all those stress factors in hectic, high-stress modern life, and they all have to be weighted together as you strive for stress-rest balance. So when you consider your workouts a great stress release from a hectic day at the office, it is on a certain level, but they are also two uh, disparate forms that are still stress to the body, still stimulus to the body and provoke a stress response. We also talked about what is an appropriate stimulation of the wonderful fight or flight response that we have genetically hardwired. And this is to elevate our function in every way for occasional uh, perceived life or death circumstances where we want to summon peak performance and the uh, disturbing contrast between what our genes expect for health and the chronic nature of stress in modern life and how we can easily abuse these very, very delicate hormonal and genetic mechanisms uh, that are collectively called the fight or flight response. Then we got into part two. And we got down and dirty with a list of symptoms. And we had two different categories or lists. And the first list was the symptoms of overreaching. And that term uh, conveys the period of time where you're in high stress behavior patterns, high stress workout patterns, but you're functioning actually optimally because of the uh, chronically high production of the stress hormones flowing through your bloodstream. So you feel great, you're energized, Uh, You're listening to how your body feels, and yes, you go and hammer again another day, but this is where we have to bring the intuitive element of decision-making into the process and realize that perhaps uh, we are tempting impending doom when we are in that fleeting state of overreaching. And after we cover those symptoms, we got into the symptoms of full-blown overtraining, burnout, all of the obvious stuff. You don't feel like exercising. Your workout performance is terrible. Your immune function is suppressed. And so you're suffering from who knows what all kinds of things like uh, autoimmune inflammatory conditions, basically breakdown, burnout, illness, injury, falling apart, and sometimes coming as a surprise because that overreaching really tricks your brain into thinking that you're becoming a superstar, you're recovering from your workouts, everything feels great, you're not sore, and this is all due to this chronic overproduction of stress hormones, you're uh, delivering a chronic low-grade inflammation to your muscles, so your muscles feel supple and strong because they're inflamed, which is what you want when you're performing a workout, but you do not want this to be triggered Uh, day after day, week after week. So it's super important to understand all those symptoms, uh, understand the distinction between overreaching and overtraining, and really focus on some of the the key, the the most important metrics and uh, up there high ranked on the list uh, these days are heart rate variability, and people are getting uh, really into that. It's becoming widespread adoption of this uh, technology where you're measuring the Uh, balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system function by way of uh, uh, measuring in EKG fashion the beat-to-beat intervals in your heartbeat. And a metronomic metronomic heartbeat is associated with a high-stress pattern, and a greater variation in beat-to-beat intervals is representative of uh, being rested, having a strong cardiovascular system, and a healthy sympathetic to parasympathetic balance. Um, Of course, the MAF test is a huge one for endurance athletes, especially 
And that's where you uh, time your performance on a consistent course. So you're doing the same test every time, for example, running eight laps around a running track and timing yourself at your maximum aerobic function heart rate as close as possible, maintaining uh, a heart rate for the test of 180 minus your age in beats per minute. And when that math test uh, gets slower, this is an indication of overreaching. And this can actually happen even while you're in the midst of a string of wonderful peak performance where you're going to the race on the weekend, you're going all out, you're performing well. And then when you try to uh, perform a submax test, which is the maximum aerobic function test, it's very non-strenuous because 180 minus your age in beats per minute indicates an aerobic pace. So you're just jogging around the track and your time is slower than usual. That's when you really got to think, hey, I'm looking at a red flag here, even though I just had a great race. And that's the part where the intuition comes into play really strongly. And we're going to emphasize that as we transition into the content in part three here. So the number one tip to recover from overtraining is don't let it freaking happen in the first place. Use your motivation, focus, discipline, resilience to make good decisions rather than just being so proud of your ability to unleash your competitive intensity at any time. And the population that I'm speaking to, the people that have those lofty competitive goals that are interested in balancing uh, a, a devoted training program into a busy, hectic life and managing family time and career with your own competitive goals. These are peak performers of the planet. Uh, thank you for listening to the show. Congratulations on having all those success factors, but also please recognize that those success factors can also be your undoing. So an intuitive approach to training entails going a step further than just relying on how you feel, which we're always told that, hey, if you feel tired or your knee hurts, you should back off. Hey, great, congratulations. Um, my dog knows the same thing, right? When my dog gets hot, uh, she stops running and lays down on the side of the trail or jumps into the water. Um, so we're, um, we're, we're more sophisticated than that animal instinct. So we have to blend that animal instinct. Of course, we pay attention to it, but also we have this unique ability to reason, problem solve, and ponder what if future scenarios. For example, uh, a lot of young runners will head off to high altitude training camp. High school teams do it, college teams do it, and they get away from uh, the particulars and the uh, busyness of daily life. And then they go and focus on training. They get up every morning, they run, they run in the afternoon, they sit around the campfire, they can't wait till the next day's run, and they go put in three weeks of extraordinary training up in the mountains, feeling great, breathing that fresh air, getting fit, uh, dropping excess body fat. And this in itself, this training camp scenario is a high stress situation, a high stimulatory environment because the training level has escalated so much from general everyday life. Uh, so oftentimes what happens is you return from this camp, you're pumped up and you want to keep going at this escalated training level while you resume your uh, busy, hectic, and more distracted daily life. So the intuitive uh, approach applied here is to finish your training camp and then give yourself some well-deserved rest rather than just uh, tapping into that competitive instinct and going and going and going. Notice that you are running on fumes on an artificial and very exciting high. Shout out to my childhood friend and longtime listener, Dr. Steven, who was up on his wedding day at 4.30 a.m. putting in his five-mile run before his day got incredibly busy. He's like, oh, I wasn't tired. I felt fine. Of course not. You're on your wedding day. You're on the greatest artificial exciting high ever. Um, so people, uh, take note because it takes many, many years of experience to learn the hard way about applying that intuition into your stress-rest balance of daily life. And it goes against uh, your pleasure-seeking nature and your desire to accomplish more and more and more, and even feeling great throughout it all, it's very important to back off and say, hey, I've put in some good work, and I'm going to uh, wait it out and do some uh, well-deserved rest. Okay, so uh, I know it's a lot to ask to walk away from your passion. You come home from that high-altitude training camp, you're more excited than ever to keep going, but this is how you avoid the dark and scary and mysterious spiral downward into the... The pits of overtraining. Okay, so and let's say you've bombed out and you're having a tough time and now you have extra time to listen to a podcast because you don't feel like exercising, you're injured, uh, you're battling illness, or you're just exhausted. Uh, the first thing to do as we aspire to heal someday 
is psychological acceptance. Okay, I screwed up. <laughs> Maybe I had bad luck. Uh, a lot of athletes will blame their preschool kids that they brought home a cold, and that's why they got struck down with eight weeks of uh, bronchitis turning into pneumonia. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, but just accept that you're in this place. It's not ideal. Um, it's part of the deal a lot of times when you're pushing the envelope, and it's just an opportunity for uh, further learning and personal growth. Then uh, the second important along the same lines is to not uh, pinpoint an arbitrary time to return to action. You have to be very patient and realize that it's kind of out of your hands and it's going to reveal, your body and your mind will reveal uh, when you're ready to return and there's nothing you can do to force it. And it's especially a bad idea to say, I need a month off. I am going to start training hard again on November 1st. That is going to make matters worse in many ways. So instead, you are going to walk away until further notice. It's like uh, someone who's uh, burnt out at the law firm and they need a break. And so they get their auto respond email and say, I'm out of the office until further notice. Huh? What? <laughs> right. That's going to be you with your training. At the same time, take this wonderful opportunity to cultivate other passions and build other aspects of your personality. Believe me, in the long run, it will make you a better athlete, a better competitor, a more well-adjusted, happy, balanced person. And so uh, teaching yourself that you can indeed step away, uh, that's a wonderful thing. My good friend, uh, my former training partner, Don Weaver, national amateur triathlon champion, uh, 15 years ago today, he passed tragically, but I think about him all the time. And one of the things I think about, he was a very uh, direct person and he would always give me the straight scoop. And when I announced to him that I was uh, falling apart and had had it psychologically, physically, and mentally with my triathlon endeavors and that I was going to retire from my professional career, he said, no, I don't think you can. You're so deep into this. All your friends, your life revolves around it. It's your career. You have your sponsors, your contracts. You can't retire. You're, you're stuck. And so I wanted to prove him right by saying, hey, I'm over it. I'm out. And I just bailed instantly and never did another race. That was back in uh, 1995. So uh, thanks for the prompting, <laughs> Don Dewey Weaver. Okay. Um, but cultivating other passions and moving on with your life is a really uh, wonderful thing to do, especially to ensure that you don't get back into this deep hole, which possibly, not naming any names here, but possibly was caused or driven by your obsession with peak performance in this narrowly focused passion of what you have. I've talked about triathletes a little bit, but we can put this out to uh, the CrossFit enthusiast who's had a perfect attendance at the gym and they're gold star by their name because they've attended more workouts or people at the health club who are, you know, diehard regulars at that 6 a.m. spin class, and all of a sudden they don't feel like going anymore. So uh, find other stuff to do. Uh, during this free time, if you will, you have extra time in your schedule. You know what's one good thing to devote it to? Is getting extra sleep. So it's time to pay back on your sleep and energy and recovery debt that you have accumulated over the past year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. And that's a wonderful way for the body to balance out. It might, mo it might not make sense to you right away or on the surface when you think, gee, I always sleep seven and a half hours per night and I have done so in the, for, for decades. And now all of a sudden you need nine. This is the body's way and the brain's way of recharging, rejuvenating, refreshing and recovering. Um, here's my story from my triathlon career. As soon as the season was over and I came home from that last race, and usually my off season was from uh, December and then resuming again in late April, and I would take off uh, December and you know get started back with training in January. I didn't have the luxury of taking more time off. But in that month of December, let me tell you, um, I would sleep usually 12 hours every night because I was so exhausted from all the jet travel, all the racing, and I could easily sleep uh, to 10, 10.30 a.m. And the only reason I got out of bed was because I felt disgusted that I was still in bed at 10 or 10.30 a.m. But for that month, sometimes six weeks after the season, that's when my body and brain needed that recharge and needed that a tremendous extra chunk of sleep when I was already sleeping a ton, as I've mentioned many times on the podcast, I already slept uh, an average of 10 hours a night throughout my career and uh, a two-hour nap every day. So extra sleep and 
find out what that means to you naturally by allowing yourself to go to bed early and, and wake up later because you're not squeezing in all these crazy workouts. Um, another uh, important factor here is to uh, look into the world of functional medicine. And our, I know our first response in Western society is to go head to the doctor when our workouts are getting slower and we're not feeling great. Uh, we have a knee injury or a sore throat or whatever. And that's great if you have actual disease patterns and need uh, medical intervention. But there's a whole nother level here to investigate. And it's widely uh, called functional medicine or alternative or progressive health care. Uh, the chiropractic community is very strong in this area where besides doing the chiropractic adjustments, they look into your nutritional patterns. And there's all kinds of it, it, an exploding industry these days, which is so wonderful, including health coaches like uh, primalhealthcoach.com. You can look at their website and uh, find a, a trained coach in a, the primal living approach, the, the comprehensive approach to primal living in your area. And so what we're looking for is people that have expertise outside of traditional Western uh, disease uh, intervention, uh, prescription medication and surgery, uh, things of that nature, to someone who can help you with your uh, possible B vitamin deficiency from advanced blood tests or your cortisol patterns when you do the salivary cortisol test from special laboratory. And these people have brought many people back to life and actually transformed many lives because now people embrace this holistic perspective. It's also called holistic medicine. So instead of just uh, being the athlete who uh, trains hard, and hits the fast food in the evening, you start to open your mind to uh, all kinds of uh, other contributing factors to your athletic success. And as I talked about in my multi-part uh, presentation about my diet over the years, uh, as a young athlete, uh, getting injured and sick over and over again on the college running team, I had to open my perspective to uh, contemplate the importance of healthy eating and other healthy lifestyle practices rather than just how many miles per week I was running. Okay. Um, it's very likely as an overtrained athlete that you have a shit ton of dysfunction that can be identified and treated in the functional medicine realm. Even though you might head off to the doctor, get your annual physical and annual blood test, and they'll say, hey, you are a, a fine, healthy athletic specimen. Everything in your blood looks great and you have a clean bill of health. Okay, that's fine. You have an absence of disease, but we are gonna look deeper at potential nutritional deficiencies, probably leaky gut syndrome, which is so common among hard, heavy training athletes because the digestive system is so sensitive to athletic stress, especially, especially when you uh, elevate your body temperature, work out for long periods of time. That is in essence, you're giving yourself leaky gut every time you do uh, a workout, especially in high temperatures and things can start to get rough, especially if you uh, eat with indiscretion. Um, NourishBalanceThrive.com, my main man, Chris Kelly, has a wonderful operation over there where you can take a short quiz uh, found off the homepage, and it will predict, it will guess uh, of some of the dysfunction that you might have by answering your questions, and you can plunge further into their wonderful consultation program. Chris himself is a uh, recovering, burnt-out, high-level uh, cycling uh, racer in cyclocross and road cycling at the highest level, Cat 1, Cat 2. And uh, he now helps other athletes, especially athletic and fitness-minded people, turn things around with that big-picture perspective. And I believe I covered some of these matters on my show with Chris Kelly, which you can find in the archives of the B-Rad podcast, and certainly on my numerous shows with Dr. Tommy Wood. Uh, Chris is former associate at Nourish Balance Thrive, but it, you, it's time to open your mind if you're overtrained and burnt out. There's all kinds of other things that you can optimize that you might not have been thinking about enough. Okay, so returning to exercise, my suggestion, my strong suggestion is to wait until you are chomping at the bit to get back out there. If you don't have that tremendous urge to lace up your shoes and head back out to your favorite forest loop, if you're a runner, or to go back to the gym and do the workout. You wait, you wait, you wait until that passion rekindles in a very authentic sense. And then when you are chomping at the bit, you finally give yourself permission to start out. And when you do resume training, you start out at half effort. So half speed, half duration, just half everything and see how you feel. Because it's uh, very easy to get fooled once you head back into training 
you start to get excited. You start to release dopamine. Remember, that's the anticipatory neurotransmitter. We call it the reward neurotransmitter, but it's more uh, accurately associated with anticipation and motivation to go get a future reward. So even the idea of returning to training can excite you and jack you up and make you feel more energetic, but you can easily get fooled, especially when you go out there and produce some stress hormones from your first workout in several weeks and you get that endorphin rush and you declare yourself back all the way because you had a great workout, but you might have a uh, rebound crash and burn experience because you're not truly uh, and totally restored and recovered. Um, you can learn so much on this topic of uh, toning it down a little bit and, and a kinder, gentler approach, especially to high intensity or extreme endurance training from my shows with Dr. Craig Marker, uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone and his book, The Big Book of Endurance Training and Racing. Mark Sisson and I have talked about this so much and written about it so much. Uh, think about the original three Primal Blueprint fitness laws as conveyed in the, uh, the first release of the Primal Blueprint. Um, and these are move frequently at a slow pace, lift heavy things, and sprint once in a while. These are our genetic expectations for health. It says nothing in our genetic DNA coding uh, to uh, prepare for the CrossFit Games or prepare for a marathon. In fact, these modern athletic endeavors are in extreme conflict with our genetic expectations for health. Again, we like to move around frequently at a slow pace. So that would be below MAF heart rate. If you're doing endurance training, the vast majority of your exercise should be at that comfortable heart rate. And then we like to do brief explosive efforts that are short in duration and high intensity. So that would be sprinting and strength training. But these hybrid workouts, or I call them blended workouts, and I talk a lot about this in the Primal Endurance book and on the Primal Endurance uh, video course, this is where we can get into trouble because it uh, prompts an overly stressful pattern of training. And what I'm talking about is a quote unquote high intensity workout that lasts for a long time and asks you again and again to deliver explosive effort even as you experience cumulative fatigue and breakdown and glycogen depletion. And so this, I'm sorry, but it pretty much characterizes the a typical modern fitness template and modern fitness programming. So if you think of a Peloton workout, what a wonderful home exercise sensation, and you're going on there for uh, whatever the duration of the workout, 45 minutes and doing a series of sprints and more sprints, or you're going to the health club and getting the peppy instructor to take you through a, a boot camp or a bar class or a spinning class. And generally speaking, in my opinion, these workouts are wonderful in so many ways, but they last a little bit too long for the average person to the extent that if you do them frequently, it can put you into this overtraining pattern. And so if you're doing anything that uh, can be conveyed as high intensity, you want to curtail the workout to well under an hour, probably a half an hour would be much better for you. Uh, unless you're training for the Olympics or at the elite level and in, in a, you know, a very uh, uh, focused, organized, regimented program, you're a collegiate athlete, whatever, you got to do what you got um, to do to, to score the points for your team or to, to get the professional contract. But the vast majority of people go hard and go home, okay? So going hard, extremely important for health, peak performance, fitness, anti-aging, but generally speaking, your cumulative high-intensity efforts might only last a few minutes, and you can have an extremely beneficial and fitness-boosting workout. I talk about my sprinting template uh, so often here, uh, where for running, it would be four to eight times 80 meters with a minute rest between these 10 to 15 to 20 second efforts. So if you're even going all the way out to the, uh, the maximum recommendation of eight times 20 seconds, that's only 160 seconds. That's less than three minutes of true high intensity sprinting for a fantastic workout. And then run screaming away from anything that has even the slightest sniff uh, of being termed to be chronic. Uh, I had Dave Scott on the show, the Ironman legend, six-time champion of the Hawaii Ironman, is still a very prominent coach in the triathlon world. And he says that he counsels his athletes to avoid those workouts that could be characterized as quote-unquote kind of hard. So kind of hard is a very, very uh, rare occasion you want to stay away from. You either want to go really hard on a short duration workout like a sprint workout I just described, or you want to go at that aerobic heart rate. It's called polarized training. Uh, Dr. Steven Seiler, American 
research physiologist based in Norway has published a lot of information about this polarized training concept where you're either going uh, nice and comfortable or you're hitting it hard and, and prompting these desired hormonal adaptations like the spike of adaptive hormones in the bloodstream after a properly conducted high intensity training session. I had Joel Jamison on the podcast where he talked about his recovery based training for his MMA athletes, including some world champions, where recovery is the central focus of the training program rather than slamming yourself. And this guy has been a prominent figure in, especially in the MMA scene and now in the general training scene for his novel ideas. Uh, He's a huge pioneer in the HRV uh, category where he's been using it for decades, this technology, uh, to determine uh, that certain workouts perform correctly. He calls them rebound workouts can actually speed recovery in comparison to just sitting around and uh, engaging in total rest. Really interesting. Uh, but his fighters, he um, got a little controversy when he first started in this game because he said, hey, you guys spar too much. It's stupid. You're tying yourself out for the fights. You should be doing a, a more appropriate training where you don't have to spar constantly and you just uh, prepare in other ways where your body's building and building and getting stronger rather than breaking down from getting in a fight (laughs) five days a week at the gym or whatever. Okay, so I think you uh, get a good sense of the importance of a kinder, gentler approach where you're really being careful, you're conducting intensity under strict parameters very properly, and if you're in the endurance scene, you are very strict and disciplined in... Uh, minimizing those heart rates to the math heart rate or below during your endurance workouts. And I have to admit, here I am at 57. I've been training hard for, oh my gosh, that's over 40 years now since I was a high school runner. And I'm still uh, somewhere positioned on this learning curve because I love to get out there, challenge my body, set lofty goals, perform magnificent athletic feats and film them and publish them on social media. I love unleashing that competitive intensity as a wonderful balance to uh, the other uh, sedate and indulgent and luxurious factors that uh, characterize modern life. But guess what? It's so easy to get carried away when you get out there. And that hour of power when I'm hitting it hard at the track and doing more jumps than I should because I'm so devoted to improve my technique and I want to do a few more and then maybe a few more after that my high intensity effort becomes a three day ordeal rather than a one hour workout. In other words, I left too much at the track and I feel it the next morning when I wake up and my calves are stiff and my back is stiff and my glutes are locked up again and I have to wait patiently because I pushed it beyond my, uh, my current capabilities and have prompted uh, additional recovery time. What's one way to determine whether you overdid it? If you feel like crap uh, at rest during, uh, the, during the work day, the, the following day, so let's say 12 hours, 24, 48 hours after uh, some of these epic workouts that we love to perform, if you feel lousy just walking around, that's an indication that you overdid it. If you have recurring muscle soreness, you are asking your body to perform a little bit more than it's capable of. I'm not talking about occasional muscle soreness where, hey, you lifted weights all winter, you go out to your first water ski session of the summer, and you can't even put your shirt on the next day. That's because you're doing an unfamiliar activity. But if you're going and doing uh, a a typical workout pattern and you're typically sore, that's a big problem. And I'm going to raise my hand and say, dang, you know, I have too much muscle soreness in my life, and I'm trying very, very hard to mitigate that to where I can perform these workouts and not be sore the next day. Then I have a big smile on my face and say, I still accomplished a lot, but I didn't overdo it. And honestly, with my sprint workouts, it's taken probably a decade to where I can announce proudly into my microphone now that I can do my typical uh, difficult, challenging sprint workout. It might be um, sets of 200 meter sprints. It might be 400, 300, 200, 100. It might be uh, three 300s, four 200s, five 100s, things that I do uh, for my goals in track and field, uh, disparate from what I recommend to the average exerciser of doing those shorter sprints, but I have to prepare for my competitive goals, right? Uh, I can finally say that I can do a template workout and the next morning not feel sore, but it has taken 10 years. <sighs> Ah, and that didn't happen when I was younger. So you younger listeners, don't worry about that. But if you're trying to uh, build skills uh, in the older athletic age groups, you have to be very, very patient and not prompt chronic muscle soreness. This is an indication that your protein synthesis, your recovery of your muscles is being uh, reallocated to muscle repair 
rather than muscle strengthening because the muscle tissue has been damaged, right? And so you got to handle the emergency first before your muscles can think about uh, getting stronger, faster, more explosive. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. Uh, so if a scientist wants to take me to task, but I'm giving this uh, valid general idea that muscle soreness is a sign that you overdid it and you need further recovery whereby you could be more consistent and perhaps get out to the track sooner and accumulate more quality efforts if you were smarter about your training. And I mentioned uh, those articles about the elite athletes that got into extreme overtraining so frequently. Uh, my mom, the, the time stamper and the link finder has them uh, saved on a separate document. Uh, the titles of the articles were running on empty and one running shoe in the grave. Uh, so this is nothing to scoff at uh, or to discount because uh, the overtraining pattern can uh, truly be career ending. There may be no coming back from uh, the extreme overtraining patterns, especially if they're uh, recurrent. No funny business. Not only that, uh, you are literally uh, compressing your lifespan rather than extending it when you are a chronically overtrained athlete. You are shortening your lifespan. And I will contend uh, during my years on the professional triathlon circuit, that was from ages 21 to age 30. That's right. I retired when I was 30, broken down and beat up and I felt 80 figuratively when I woke up in the morning as a 30-year-old athlete because I had so many aches and pains and stiffnesses. I couldn't even put weight on my right foot until I hobbled out to the jacuzzi to stick my foot in the jets and deal with this chronic extreme plantar fasciitis. I had suppressed immune function. I had suppressed endocrine function, suppressed hormone function. So I contend that that decade on the triathlon circuit most likely aged me in a literal sense, in the literal cellular quantum physical sense, like Deepak Chopra talks about, probably aged me 15 or 20 years. So I doubled the rate of aging during that 10-year stint, uh, traveling around the globe like a crazy business traveler, but also uh, hitting it hard and pedaling and sprinting and swimming in foreign bodies of water and just mixing it up on the pro circuit. And I'm sorry to say, in many ways, this is the price that you have to pay to make those incremental improvements to excel at the highest level of athletics when you're looking at the Olympic athletes, the professional athletes. They are definitely making an inherent trade-off between general health and longevity and present-day peak performance. Uh, for most of us, and even for the elite athletes listening, you want to strive to do it as intelligently and as less uh, destructively as possible. So that's what we're talking about here. So whatever the nature of your competitive goals, if they're super lofty, hey, um, you know, deal with it and get a lot of sleep. And if they're just trying to balance, um, you know, stressful modern life with some fun and excitement, you can do it in a really smart way where your athletic pursuits uh, by and large, promote health and longevity rather than compromise it. And I'm going to put myself in that category today because, of course, I'm not doing these crazy endurance feats anymore. And my workouts, even though I get a little sore, hey, um, I'm building my explosiveness. I'm preserving my balance. Uh, I have those competitive goals that keep me fresh and excited, not only for athletic goals, but for all different goals in my life. Uh, my body composition, my diet, all these things are dialed thanks to uh, sensible and age-appropriate athletic goals. And I must say, what is super awesome to see in modern elite level athletics is I believe the athletes are much smarter and more sensible today than they were back in my time. Uh, that goes for all the major professional sports, uh, the track and field athletes. They're doing something right, uh, not only because the uh, records uh, continue to escalate in, in many cases. Um, some of the records are still sticking around, which is pretty awesome uh, on a side note as well. Uh, the high jump record is now 30 years old uh, for both uh, males and females, somewhere around 30 years old. And I'm not talking about the drug tainted records from the Eastern Bloc times where the, the female 800 meter record uh, is from 1983 at 1 minute 53 seconds, widely regarded to be fueled by the uh, systematic doping of the Eastern Bloc. But I'm talking about, boy, there were guys a long time ago Hikam El Garouz, the greatest middle distance runner of all time, still has the mile record from 1997, 25 years at three minutes 43. So we had these exceptional athletes back then. But generally, uh, I think uh, by and large, you're seeing NFL athletes, NBA athletes with longer careers, uh, less chronic injuries, definitely less breakdown after their careers are over. And even in sprinting in the Olympics, where everyone widely believed that sprinting was a young person's game. You have people like Usain Bolt 
Elaine Thompson and Shelly Ann Fraser Price, the Jamaicans with very long and successful careers, still going strong. Uh, Elaine Thompson and Shelly Ann Fraser Price had the best season of their careers last year, both in their 30s. They've been around forever. Justin Gatlin, the great American sprinter, made the Olympic final in the 100 meters at age 39. And he won Olympic or World Championship medals over a decade apart. A fantastic duration. He finally retired from elite competition at age 40. But boy, um, when a guy at 39 is one of the fastest eight athletes in the world, you'd know he's doing something right. Uh, the endurance athletes, the same. I give tremendous credit to the Brownlee brothers from Great Britain for dominating the sport of triathlon at the Olympic distance for over a decade. Uh, this guy, Christian Blumenthal from Norway, uh, won the Olympic gold medal in Tokyo last year. He reputedly trains for seven hours a day. He's just a machine out there cranking and getting to the most incredibly high fitness level that we couldn't even imagine back then where these guys are racing a mile swim, biking 25 miles, and then getting off the bike and running a 29-minute 10K like a true track star. Uh, there's a Swedish speed skating champion uh, who uh, won Olympic gold. And he's had some popular YouTube videos where he explains that he just gets out there and trains for six hours every day, but it's in a comfortably paced aerobic fashion. And he credits this type of training as nourishing and strengthening. And then, of course, when you want to win uh, the gold in speed skating, like when Eric Hyden was winning those uh, 5,000 meter, 10,000 meters, they're going very fast. So they're training uh, very hard and doing some high intensity workouts. But to have that base of riding your bicycle for six hours, day after day after day, and then applied to specific speed skating workouts, that's pretty awesome that the athlete not only doesn't break down, but just ascends to the highest level of aerobic conditioning where they can handle the high stress workouts that uh, help make them Olympic champion. Okay, that's a lot to chew on, but I would like to end uh, on another note where if you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're wondering why me when you've plunged into this uh, dismal overtraining pattern or it's happened again and again, it's important to understand that these genetic differences that we have are profound. And some people can simply tolerate more stress load in training and in daily life than other people. And there's no explaining it. You can do the best to optimize yourself and not look around and uh, compare to others. Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. Okay, and uh, I was someone that needed to hear that back when I was a triathlete because I simply couldn't handle the typical volume of many of my competitors on the pro circuit. And I would get worn out trying to keep up with them in training and then feel sorry for myself and wonder why couldn't I ride my bike and run and swim as far as these other guys. I want it just as badly. I'm just as focused. I'm just as devoted. Uh, but my body simply couldn't handle it. And I had to learn the hard way to take matters into my own hands and do what was best for me without constantly comparing myself or trying to adhere to someone else's recommended training schedule. And the guy who was really uh, invaluable in helping me embrace this uh, mentality was Mark Sisson, my original coach uh, way back in the 80s when I was racing on the pro circuit. I was a young athlete on the pro circuit, and he became my coach in Los Angeles and would constantly hammer home these points that I had to trust myself, focus on myself, focus on breakthrough workouts rather than uh, the consistent application of exercise stress day after day after day. Just focus on doing your best workouts once in a while, and that's how you get fitter. You don't have to be a machine, perhaps like the person that you're training with and lamenting that you can't handle it. Um, and boy, then you get to this point where you're doing the best you can and you're seeing someone training harder than you and your competitive instinct says, I want to rise up to the next level and kick that person's butt or whatever. <laughs> get on the podium, whatever your goal is. Um, and if it's not in the cards for you, I, I, I asked this question of Phil Maffetone, and I remember his uh, memorable answer that he said, um, if you go to the marathon finish line and, and watch the people crossing the finish line, um, of course, there's variation in training patterns. But for people who are doing their very best and optimizing their physical potential, sometimes the difference in your finish time at the marathon is freaking genetics and there's nothing you can do about it. And so some of us listening might have to be content with finishing in the middle of the pack rather than aspiring to the podium and getting into that frustrating overtraining pattern when you want to get more out of your body than is naturally uh, there and ready and accessible. So um, if you watch the documentary that was a centerpiece with Michael Phelps, but it covered a lot of Olympic athletes, and it was called The Weight of Gold. You can find it online. 
um, they talked about the struggles and the frustrations and the depression and the serious mental health issues that many elite athletes uh, suffer from, uh, in part due to their obsession with peak performance and uh, valuing and, and, and obsessing so highly uh, on their journey that they have a difficult time adjusting to real life. For example, after the Olympics are over, they plunge into depression uh, and so forth. And it's a pretty sobering account of the things that Olympic athletes deal with that are behind the scenes. They've been brought further to the scenes by this great documentary, as well as the struggles of Simone Biles in the Olympics, the gymnast that uh, kind of freaked out and had to pass on many events, even though she was widely considered to be the greatest of all time and had that pressure heaped on her shoulders. Uh, the tennis player, Naomi Osaka, who has been public with her mental health struggles that are affecting her tennis career. So, hey, you know what? Maybe just aspiring to do your best, not getting too caught up in comparison, accepting the genetic particulars that might be your limitations. Maybe that's more healthy, well-adjusted way to approach sport than going for the gold, which is so glorified and dramatized. And we've been programmed into our brain that that's the ultimate. So uh, one of my favorite one-liners is to, when you're deciding how to train, take what your body gives you each day and don't try to force more. If you can adhere to that and honor that and be content with that, that's going to keep you out of those overtraining holes. I hope you enjoyed part three. Please listen to all of them, put it all together and stay out of that overtraining club. Hope to see you out there performing magnificent athletic feats, enjoying it, challenging yourself but being smart and sensible at all times. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this episode and encourage you to check out the Primal Endurance Mastery Course at primalendurance.fit. This is the ultimate online educational experience where you can learn from the world's great coaches and trainers, diet, peak performance, and recovery experts, as well as lengthy one-on-one -on -one interviews from several of the greatest endurance athletes of all time not published anywhere else. It's a major educational experience with hundreds of videos, but you can get free access to a mini course with an ebook summary of the Primal Endurance approach and nine step-by-step -step videos on how to become a Primal Endurance athlete. This mini course will help you develop a strong basic understanding of this all-encompassing approach to endurance training that includes primal aligned eating to escape carbohydrate dependency and enhance fat metabolism, building an aerobic base with comfortably paced workouts, strategically introducing high intensity strength and sprint workouts, emphasizing rest recovery and annual periodization, and finally cultivating an intuitive approach to training instead of the usual robotic approach of fixed weekly workout schedules. Just head over to primalendurance.fit and learn all about the course and how we can help you go faster and preserve your health while you're at it. 